monitors? Yeah, we got oh, well, you. Maybe us too now. Do what? Maybe us as well now. Okay, we don't know what's happening. We just need to pray is what we need to do. As I mentioned earlier, the Bissell family, let's pray for them that God's grace and comfort would be with them tonight. They're a wonderful family. And let's just ask God to minister to them. There's not one of those girls I can't look at them and see Barbara Bissell in them. Not one of them. Each, every one of them. And uh, let's just pray that God give them grace in the days ahead. And, and there's some other things that, that has happened that um, I, I won't mention, but there's some other things that has complicated some things. So let's pray for them at this time. Also, Sister Holman, Sister Tina, uh, Sister Sowards, some folks said are in need of God's touch of healing, Sister Birchfield, uh, S Sister Duncan, Sister Rhodes and others, um, Brenda Knapp, uh, Brent's aunt, uh, in desperate need of prayer. We had a lot of requests during prayer meetings tonight, desperate requests, urgent requests, a backslider. Uh, away from God and uh, in need of God's healing, but more than that, in need of God's salvation and renewal. And, and so we need to pray for all of these needs tonight. You got a need, slip up your hand. Uh, let me mention, I don't think you'll mind, Sister uh, Zizimer, that uh, she's having some tests tomorrow. So we want to pray over that and ask God to, to move in that situation. And Sister Castro's nephew, Greg, uh, and uh, cousin, cousin, uh, in desperate need of, of God's uh, unanswered prayer for him. So many urgent needs, but a God that responds to the urgent. He, he responds to the urgent. So let's, let's pray tonight and ask God to minister and, the, and to bless this service tonight. God, in your precious name, Lord, we thank you tonight and we worship you. Lord, we magnify your name and pray, God, over this service. God, that this service would be in the will of God. That, Lord, we would just open our hearts and our minds to you tonight to allow the Holy Ghost to minister to us, to allow the Spirit of God to minister to us spiritually, God, and physically in our bodies. We pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that God, your hand would be upon every need, every hand that was raised in this service. God, whatever it may be, there's nothing too hard for you. There's nothing that you cannot do. So, Lord, we pray, God, that you would minister in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, God, tonight that, Lord, you minister to the Bissell family, and we lift them up. We love this family. And ask you, God, to give them comfort. God, wrap your arms around each one, the friends and, and the church that uh, are all mourning the loss of Sister Bissell. But we rejoice in knowing, God, that she is in the presence of God. I pray, Lord, tonight that, God, you minister to all the sick. Lord, we pray healing, virtue. Lord, let healing miracles even right now take place in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, God, tonight we seek your face. We seek the face of God. We seek the mind of God to know the will of God. And Lord God, that you would move according to your purpose. Your purpose, God. Hallelujah. 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 In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. To supply my every need, I will trust in you, oh God. Yes, I believe I will trust in you, oh God. Supply my 
like to be anointed and prayed for, would you come? If you need to be anointed and need us to pray for you tonight, would you come? Thank you, Jesus. Sister Hayes, would you take these, Sister Hayes, would you take these prayer requests and pray over them? I've also got one missionary letter from Brother and Sister Kelly. 
our missionaries to Northern Europe. Who will take this? And Sister D, thank you. Thank you for taking that. Amen. You may be seated today. I want to go ahead and mention to you uh, the arrangements for Sister Bissell. Uh, some of you have been wondering. Uh, the funeral or the visitation is going to be Friday evening from 5 until 7. Uh, everything's going to be a white funeral home at Coolville, not Colville, as was originally posted on Facebook by whoever did that. And uh, so it's Coolville, White Funeral Home in Coolville uh, is where everything will be. Visitation, 5 to 7 on Friday with the service uh, being Saturday at 3 o'clock, also at White Funeral Home in Coolville. And I want to thank, uh, there have been some folks who brought some food for me to take over. I'll take it back over tomorrow. Uh, to them, thank you for doing that, and uh, so that I can, we can bless them. I took some food over today to them, and I'll take some more tomorrow to them. We will be taking up an offering on Sunday. Uh, we are not doing the dinner. Uh, they've already secured the VFW, uh, they, and this is their choice. We, we had fully intended on, on doing the dinner. We were going to make the dinner. Matter of fact, I thought it was our really our our responsibility to to provide the dinner. Uh, but they they have chosen to go with the VFW to uh, for the dinner. And I told them that we would uh, since we're not doing the dinner, we will help pay on the dinner. So we'll be taking up an offering Sunday specifically to give to them. Uh, to help them with the expenses of the dinner. They are paying for that themselves. And so we will, uh, we will do that and help them. But I wanted to go ahead and make you aware of that while we're online and we've got folks watching because later on when we normally make the announcements, uh, we're not online. So I wanted to make sure that those announcements were made while we were online. Ushers, would you come? We are gonna worship in giving as we always do. It is a biblical, it is a biblical practice of worship to give. And so we are going to give us unto the Lord. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, to be in your house, to worship you, to feel the presence of God. And I pray tonight, God, that as we worship you in our giving, that we worship you out of a cheerful heart, that, God, we worship you, God, because we're blessed beyond measure. And, God, we give unto you, for you have truly given unto us. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.
your hands. Lord, do it, God, on us. Do it on us, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm so thankful for what God is doing in our church and how God is moving. And Sunday, God filled another one with the Holy Ghost. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. And uh, we'll be giving, uh, I'm sure we'll be baptizing him uh, this coming Sunday. We'll be baptizing David in Jesus' name this coming Sunday. So we'll have another. Do you know that makes, what, four Sundays in a row? We've had either baptisms or Holy Ghost or both going on. That's pretty awesome. I love it. I absolutely love it. And I love what I feel is happening in our church and what God is doing among our church. I'm so thankful for the group of young people every Monday night who meet for prayer meeting. I don't know if you're aware of this or not. I, most of you may probably are. But every Monday night, a group of young people on their own, and this started last year. Last year, this started last year. And they come every Monday night and they pray. They come into this sanctuary or into the, into the teen class or um, somewhere in the, in the building and they pray and seek the face of God. And then they do the apostolic thing and go eat. And uh, so we know, it, we know it's apostolic. And, uh, but they, they've been praying and they've been seeking God. And I believe it's out of that prayer meeting. What, some of the fruit, that we're, the fruit that we're witnessing is coming out of that prayer meeting of what God is doing among, those, among the, our young people and, and how God is stirring. I've asked Sister Janie to, uh, to speak to us tonight and to bring us a word. I believe she has a word. Uh, not only from the Lord, but I believe she has a word from her own heart, uh, the desires of her heart. So, Sister Janie, God bless you. In Jesus' name. I'll use the mic this time, sorry. All right, we're going to Acts 2. Starting at verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And I have one more verse, Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Pastor, would you pray? Jesus, we thank you, God. Thank you for your word, powerful word. Pray that this God will be released in the sanctuary. I pray no anointing upon this woman tonight. Pray no anointing to woman to be a good one. But God, I pray your anointing on us to receive what you are ready to speak into our lives. Let something be spoken. You may be seated. Now this is going to come to no surprise to anybody, but based off of what you've seen in the news, what you've felt in, in service lately, there's something stirring. There's something moving in this generation. There's conversations that are being had that aren't normally the norm. I've, I've noticed it at work now. You know, I, I've been having different conversations with my coworkers about what's happening at that university. And people at work, they're starting the conversations about it. They're asking questions. There's, there's a genuine curiosity in the world right now about what's happening. You know, I, I work with people, and I'm sure you all do too, or, you know, you interact with people in the day-to-day -day from many different faiths, different backgrounds, um, different denominations. But at work, when it comes to asking about the supernatural things being poured out on God's people, my coworkers are coming to me. It's not because I'm better than anybody else, but it's because they know I'm a part of something like this. Yeah. They know who I represent. They know what I stand for. 
they know that I'm different. I've seen some of the videos of healings, of, of demons being cast out. I've heard people there praying in the spirit. We heard pastor talk about at the beginning of prayer meeting, the reports of people being filled with the Holy Ghost, people being renewed in the Holy Ghost, people having to go to hotels and being baptized in Jesus' name. That's awesome, that's exciting. I've been seeing things about different newscasters and celebrities and politicians and even gospel artists trying to attach their name to this, trying to reach out to the university and saying, well, let me lend my talents. Let me see what I can do. Let, let me and my team come. And the university saying, we appreciate what you want to do. We appreciate what you're trying to do, but don't come. If you're coming with your own agenda, we don't want you to disrupt the flow of what God is doing. That is an awesome mindset to have. And just like what Pastor said Sunday, these people, they're just now being exposed to the things that we have the honor and the privilege to tap into every single day if we take the opportunity to. They're just now grasping it. That makes me so excited. I was 19 years old when I got the Holy Ghost. I know what that feels like. So I know what that fire, what that passion's like. And seeing that, it renewed it in me. I wanted to go back to not only feeling that, I wanted to go deeper. I shouldn't, that should not have been the high point of my life. That should not have been the most passionate, the most fiery part of my love for God, my relationship with God. It should be what's coming next. But if I don't have the mindset for it, it's not going to happen. And if we aren't careful, we can get prideful. We can get spiteful about what's breaking out on these college campuses. Well, I wish we had revival like that. I wish we had prayer meeting like that. I wish we were baptizing 20 people every Sunday service. I wish we had 14 new visitors every single week. I wish we saw the miraculous. That's a dangerous attitude to have because we think that mindset, well, that's one of encouragement. You know, we can be happy for them, but we want to see it here. But in fact, it kills revival. With that mentality, you've eliminated the expectation that it's going to happen here. Right. When you come in with that mentality, you have put a limitation on God. Not because he isn't big enough, not because he can't do it, but because you don't think he can. You know, God wants a revived church. He wants a spiritually thriving church. Right. But he's not going to force that on his church. You have to open up to it. You have to be willing to receive it. He's not going to force his hand. That's not who he is. We get caught up in the mentality of looking for an exit strategy. We want a way out. We, we want to go where it's already happening instead of starting it ourselves. We don't want to look for the entrance into going deeper with him. But the same God that's breaking out on these college campuses, that's the same God that's here in Ravenswood. It's the same God that's in Ripley, that's in Fair Plain, that's in Racine, that's in Parkersburg, that's in Athens. You know, and the same God that poured out his spirit in the upper room on the day of Pentecost is the same God that we feel tonight. It's the same God that we feel. But are we willing to have the mindset of the hungry? Are we willing to shift our focus? Because if we want the harvest to be bountiful, then our prayer life needs to reflect it. And I'll go one step further. If we want to keep the harvest, it's one thing to have people receiving the Holy Ghost and baptizing people in Jesus' name. But if we can't keep them here, if it stops on that day, we've done them a disservice. We've got to have the mindset to go, okay, how can I love you? How can I encourage you? How can I walk with you? How can I be here for you? That's the mentality that we need to have. And a lot of us, we desire those things. We have the desire to pray more often. We have the desire to pray more effectively with greater passion, with greater authority. We want to connect with God in a deeper way. I, I, I think there's not a person in here that doesn't have that want in their heart, truly, that they want that. But a little closer to home, we also battle the struggle to pray for a particular length of time. 
only to catch ourselves checking our watch, checking our phone, wondering, okay, is there one more song in this prayer playlist? You know, we, we're waiting for the alarm to go off. We, we've put God in a box, and we don't even realize that we're doing it. We want to break through. We want to know and experience God intimately through prayer. We want to leave prayer time refreshed and renewed, but we start treating our prayer life and our fasting as an obligation. It's nothing more than that. You know, the Israelites, they were instructed to pitch their tents facing the tabernacle. The arrangement of the camp forced them to view the outer court of the tabernacle day and night. They saw the smoke. They heard the sacrifices. They smelled burning flesh. It wasn't a pretty picture. You know, that's what it looked like. The average worshiper, they could access and view the outer core of the tabernacle, but only a select few could ever journey deeper into the presence of the Lord. Many never go beyond that outer court. That outer court, it symbolizes that, that fleshly, sacrificial element of prayer and spiritual discipline that just stinks. It's not great. It's not good. We don't like it. We don't want to have to do it, but it's essential. Our New Testament covenant with God, it invites us, it mandates us that we go further into his presence. We should go all the way past the brazen altar and into the Holy of Holies. But we have to start looking for entrances rather than exits in prayer. The tabernacle design had three different entrances, and each one took the, per took the person closer to the Holy of Holies. The first one, it was this easily accessible curtain that protected the outer court. Then you had a slightly more inaccessible curtain that protected the outer court from the inner court. But separating that from the Holy of Holies stood a massive curtain that contained no visible entrance. And, and some scholars, they think it was either four inches to a foot thick. So it, it's hard to peer through that. It's hard to try and find an entrance. And so it seemed that the high priest was required to wait until he was supernaturally ushered into God's presence. He had to wait on the Lord, but he had to be actively looking for that entrance. He could have been standing there waiting on God, but if he wasn't looking for that entrance, he wasn't going in. So many times we are standing at the door of what's supposed to come next, and we're waiting on God to move the curtain when he's wanting you to look for the entrance. How is that different to how we typically approach God in prayer? We're more concerned with the exit. We have the time frame, and if God doesn't usher us into the Holy of Holies in that time frame, we leave disappointed. We think, well, it's not for me today. Well, I guess we're not having that kind of prayer meeting today. You know, we come into prayer meeting on Wednesday night. You know, we might start after, you know, prayer requests, 7 to 5, 7 to 10. And then we're still checking the watches for 15 minutes. Going, okay, well, when's it church time? Well, church has to start at 730. Why? Why can't we just go straight from prayer meeting right into worship? Who says we have to stop everything? If there's a flow of the Spirit moving, there's nothing hindering you. There's nothing that says, okay, take a bathroom break, let's go. There's no service, there's no schedule to this. If God's moving, we need to be obedient to it. And that's not always easy to do. You've got to put your convenience aside. You've got to put your comfort level aside. Because how often have we missed out because we're looking for an exit instead of an opening? One of my favorite pieces of scripture is 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, And here we see God speaking to Solomon. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Verse 15, now mine eyes shall be open, and mine ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now have I chosen and sanctified this house, that my name may be there forever, and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. You know, God's not a respecter of persons, but he's a respecter of obedience. He's a respecter to your sacrifice. He responds to your hunger. You know, studies in animals have shown that hunger activates extra nerve cells in the brain that control perception. 
When an animal's hungry, certain senses are heightened. It has looser inhibitions, and it has a willingness to take risks. If we showed hunger for God, for the supernatural, for the miraculous, for the prophetic, what spiritual senses would be heightened? If we showed hunger for God, imagine what kind of worship service we would break out into if we lowered our own inhibitions a little bit. If we were hungry for God, how much more willing would we be to step out of our comfort zone and reach the lost? Because the thing is, is that in my opening text, at the beginning of Acts 2, they had to come from off the mount to go to the upper room. But at some point, they had to come out of the upper room to reach the people. So many times we want an upper room experience, but we never want to leave the upper room. Right now, we're in that upper room experience, and God's looking at us going, you need to come down now. It's time for you to come down. And some of us aren't willing to do it. Because where we miss out a lot of times is that we don't understand the difference between wanting God and having a hunger for God. Not everyone that was on the mount that watched Jesus ascend into heaven made it to the upper room. They may have had a want, but they didn't have a hunger. They didn't think this was vital. They didn't think it was essential. Want says, that would be awesome. That would be fantastic if it happened. But if it doesn't happen, I'll live. I may not like it, but I'll live. Hunger says, I can't survive without this. It is essential. It is vital. I will die if I don't have it. That is the mentality that we need to have. Of course we want the things of God, but do we hunger for it? Does it show? You know, the prophet Elijah, when he was being challenged by the prophets of Baal, back in 2nd, not 2nd Kings, I'm sorry, 1st Kings, chapter 18, Verse 33, it says, And he put the wood in order, cut the bullock in pieces, laid them on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water, pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Verse 34, and he said, Do it the second time. And they did the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran round about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. We like to look at that story because when the fire fell, it licked up the water, it licked up the stones, it took care of all of that. We like to focus on that part of the miracle. But what I like to focus on is Elijah's faith. Because you have to remember, they were at the tail end of a three-year drought. It wasn't just fill up four of these. Four barrels. And he did it three different times. You can go back to that third grade math, four times three, that's 12 barrels. I remember that one. But so, you know, he had them dump 12 barrels of water at the altar at the tail end of this drought. He demonstrated that that's a sacrifice that's tangible. We don't think about that kind of sacrifice with the water. Because in essence, he was saying, Lord, if we don't see the fire and rain today, we're going to die. He had that much faith that God was going to do exactly what he said he was going to do and show up and be exactly who he said he was going to be that he was willing to make that sacrifice. There can be no fire without sacrifice, whether that's your money, whether that's your time, your energy, your comfort, your convenience. I don't feel comfortable doing this. I don't. It's a sacrifice. But you know what? When you have something that's burning on the inside of you, that you have to say it, you have to get it out, it's worth it. It's worth it. Living for God is worth it. Doing the things that I do, it's worth it. Those prayer meetings on Monday night, we're seeing it. It's worth it. It's worth the sacrifice. Because the thing is, is that God requires all that you have. He gave it to you all, so why shouldn't we give it back to him? When we went to CCYC um, just a couple of weeks ago, and we're seeing all these different youth groups and, and seeing friends of ours who are now, you know, youth pastors and, and pastor's wives. And they're bringing, you know, these youth groups in and watching how last year they maybe have had six or seven people. And now they're bringing in 20 kids. That's awesome. You know, I'm, I'm rejoicing with them. But then I'm looking at our group 
and going, you know, thinking to our Sunshine kids, that's a, that's a pretty big group. Five, ten years, we're going to have a pretty good group to bring here. Now, mind you, what I thought was well-intentioned, God chastised me. And God immediately convicted me and said, why can't I move in the meantime? Why can't I supply that now? Why do you have to wait five years? Why do you have to wait ten years? Why can't you go out and get them now? The harvest field's there. You've got to go get them. You've got to go pray for them. You know, if I can't revive my own mentality and get hungry for the things of God, I am going to be sitting and waiting. I need to search for the opening. I need to search for the entrance of what God is going to do with this church, what God is going to do with these kids, what he's going to do with this youth. I need to get a hold of this gospel and spread it. This message, it's just as much for me as it is for anybody else. Right. You know, we also, we tend to think of revival as souls being saved. People being filled with the Holy Ghost, being baptized in Jesus' name, walking away from the world, living a holy and separated lifestyle. But that's not revival. That's the harvest. Because you can't revive what hasn't started living yet. You revive what was once alive. Revival's for the church. The harvest is for the lost. You can have a harvest and not have a revival. But anytime you have revival, the harvest will always precede it. You can't just want revival. You can't just want the harvest. You have to be hungry for it. It has to be vital to your survival. You have to wake up in the morning with your feet hitting the floor and going, God, if you can't put someone in front of me, send me to someone. Send me to someone that I can win. Send me to someone that I can invite to church. Send me to someone that I can pray for, that I can minister to. That needs to be the mentality. Sister Kinsey and I, we watched um, an interview just the other day of a, uh, a young minister in our movement, um, Brother Caleb Herring, and he made the statement, and it was just, it, it convicted me, it hit me. And he said that he prays the prayer, God, if I won't do all that you would have for me to do and be all that you would have for me to be and experience all that you would have for me to experience, go ahead and take me. Because my life has no purpose if it's not all for you. We miss that. We miss the mark on that so much. We get so wrapped up in our jobs. We get so wrapped up in our social lives. We get so wrapped up sometimes even in our own family drama. We get so wrapped up in the little things that in the grand scheme of things don't matter. Because if we are not pursuing God's vision, if we're not pursuing God's heart, if we're not pursuing his mind, We've missed it. Larissa, she encourages me so much. No one prompted her to come up to the front when she did. She came of her own accord, her own volition. It wasn't to be seen. If you spend any amount of time with her, you know it wasn't to be seen. You know it wasn't to be recognized. But it was because she has a hunger and a desire for God and for things that she doesn't even fully understand yet. You and I have that understanding. We have that desire, and yet she can come up like it's nothing. When she got the Holy Ghost, when Devin got the Holy Ghost, there was no prompting. When most people, we would have kind of retreated within ourselves. We would have gone and waited until prayer line. We would have waited for altar call and then allowed God to move on us. God isn't regulated to just moving during altar call. They couldn't wait. Because children get persistent when they want something. They get persistent when they're hungry. They resolve that nothing else will do, nothing else will satisfy them until they get what they came for. We need to remember, we're also children of God. That needs to be our mindset. We need to stop waiting for the invitation for altar call. We need to stop waiting until Wednesday night to feel the call to prayer. 
We need to stop waiting for the music to get us to a place where we're so emotional that that's when we allow God to move. I'm guilty of it. Being up here, there's a lot of times that I rely way too heavily on what song we're singing or how the music sounds for me to allow God to speak to me. That is not the mindset that we need to have. I don't want to wait anymore. Because here's what's happening in the world is Acts 2 and 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. That's not just Pentecost, not just Baptist, not just Methodist. He's pouring it out on the homosexual. He's pouring it out on the murderer. He's pouring it out on the Hindu. He's pouring it out on the Muslim. He's pouring it out on everybody. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You want a revival? It's here. You want the harvest? It's here. You want to see the miraculous? We saw it Sunday. Pastor said it. The greatest miracle that we can witness is watching someone being filled with the Holy Ghost. You're part of the church that's having the miraculous happen to them. We need to start acting like we are seeing. We need to receive it. We need to start speaking in faith. We're going to see this every Sunday. We're going to see this every Wednesday. You don't have to go somewhere else to get it. How many congregation members, show of hands, how many people live in Ravenswood? Not even a fourth. What town name is in whatever church name we're calling ourselves now? <laughs> Ravenswood. Look at how many people are from Ravenswood in this church. If you look at that picture right there, that bridge is going to look pretty familiar to you because that bridge is just right out. I'm horrible with directions. Here, here, <laughs> there. <laughs> Told you. Okay. But that right there, that's our harvest field. We have a whole town, we have a whole community that we haven't even begun to reach yet. We haven't even begun to see come in here yet. We need to be praying. We need to get hungry. We need to be fasting. I feel so strongly in my spirit that God wants to pour out an abundance in our church unlike anything that we've ever seen, but you have to be ready to receive it. He's not going to pour it out if we're not ready for it. Why don't you go ahead and stand? We need to start making sacrifices to see it. We need to have the hunger to have it. We have to start leaving the upper room and going out. They had to take the revival to the streets. They had to go. That is our calling. That is our mission. The goal was not to get the Holy Ghost and be baptized in Jesus' name and live a holy and separated life and just stay here. That is not the goal. You know too many people. I know too many people. We have parents, we have grandparents, you have sons and daughters and grandchildren and nieces and nephews and cousins and brothers and sisters that need the Holy Ghost. Yes. They need to be sitting on those pews with you. I, I feel prompting by the Holy Ghost right now. I want us to take a moment. I want us to pray over the city of Ravenswood. I want us to pray that God give us favor, that God will open doors that were closed. I pray that we be a light to those that are in the city. 
that God start putting people in our paths that weren't there before, that every time someone comes out on the four lane, they feel a pull and a draw to our service. They feel a pull and a draw to the Holy Ghost. God, give us authority. God, give us power. God, give us anointing. Lord Jesus, give us...